it's now 7.05. Thanks to everybody for coming to the Youth in Climate Action event. Uh, my name is John Smiley, and I am with the League of Women Voters of Montgomery County and our newly formed climate team. I'm going to hand the host responsibilities off to my associate Brock here for a minute so that he can manage any newcomers uh, while I give the intro. So as I mentioned, my name is John Smiley. I'm with the League of Women Voters of Montgomery County and our newly formed climate team. The League of Women Voters is a proudly nonpartisan organization supporting neither candidates nor political parties, but we encourage informed and active participation in government and work to increase understanding of major public policy issues and influence public policy through education and advocacy. The League believes that climate change is a serious threat facing our nation and our planet. So our chapter formed our climate team with the following mission. To promote local engagement with the climate crisis, educating our fellow citizens on the science behind it and the challenges it poses, while also furthering climate-friendly endeavors and policies. These include not only energy conservation, the promotion of renewable energy resources, and the reduction of air pollution, but also climate resilience strategies to help our community withstand increasing temperatures and precipitation. Climate change is a global issue, but every individual, community, and government has a role to play and challenges to face, and we aim to lead the community in the face of those challenges. To that end, we organized this event tonight to help our youth engage with climate action, and we are very fortunate to be graced with three youth climate leaders who will speak to us about their experiences in climate and sustainability advocacy. Our three speakers tonight are Annabelle Prokopi, a junior at West Lafayette High School and a leader with West Lafayette Climate Strikes and the statewide organization Confront the Climate Crisis. Ian Rollins, a Wabash student and, is, and the student chair of the Environmental Concerns Committee. And Iris O'Donnell Belisario, a recent Purdue graduate, a resiliency coordinator for Earth Charter Indiana and recipient of the IU Environmental Resilience Institute Hoosier Resilience Hero Award. Mayor Barton will also be giving us a brief introduction, and I believe we're joined in the audience by members of the County and City Council, Tom Mellish and Ethan Hollander, though they both warned that they might be traveling and may be dialing in uh, at a later time. Uh, after the speakers each have a turn, we'll open up for discussion and Q&A. And if you stay to the end, uh, at 7.55, we will announce a giveaway for some randomly selected attendees to receive a copy of Youth to Power, a book by youth climate activist Jamie Margolin. Before I hand it off, I would like to explain climate change in just 10 words. Experts agree. It's real. It's us. It's bad. And there's hope. Uh, that is to say that over 97% of scientists and all national academies of science agree that the globe is in fact warming, the climates are changing, and then they agree that the cause is human activity, primarily the burning of fossil fuels. Climate change will come with more intense heat waves, droughts, floods, and storms, but humanity has the power to change the course it's on. And what do climate scientists say gives them hope? To quote Dr. Michael Mann of Penn State, what gives me hope is the mobilization we are now seeing among our youth. We finally arrived at a point where there's a critical mass demanding action on climate. And that's exactly what we're here to talk about today. So now I will hand it off to Mayor Barton. Good evening, everyone. I uh, thank you for the opportunity to say a few words this evening. And most importantly, thank you for participating in this evening's event. Um, I apologize. I'm uh, on the road right now at a softball game, uh, the weather through the spring sports schedule off a little bit this week. So uh, if I'm a little out of place, that's why. Uh, I want to be one of the first to, to tell you happy Earth Day um, and uh, for gathering this evening to talk about this very important topic that really does have profound local, national, and global implications. Um, locally, we've really kind of been approaching this as a two-pronged issue. Uh, first and foremost, adapting to the changes in our climate that are already happening. Um, we've done several things, and I'll, I'll briefly touch on those. Uh, and then number two, uh, really taking better care of our home and our environment by making decisions based on the long-term impacts instead of just looking at the short-term impacts. I'm very proud of our local efforts. Uh, I think our community has, has really stepped up uh, and taken this seriously. Uh, on the front of adapting to the current realities, uh, we have invested very heavily in our stormwater infrastructure because, you know, it, ultimately we have to adapt and handle much uh, greater rainfalls in a shorter amount of time than we've ever had to do in our history. So we've really had to 
think about that and, and adapt to that. It also means we've adopted much tougher uh, developmental standards. Well, when new new structures are built and new properties are developed, uh, they have to comply with much tougher standards than they did, you know, 50 years ago. Uh, I'm also very proud of the fact that we have worked very aggressively the last few years to eliminate all of our combined sewer overflows uh, in Crawfordsville, uh, which means we are no longer uh, discharging untreated sewage into Sugar Creek. And that had happened during very large range of rain events for many years. Um, that has been fixed and has been totally eliminated in our community. Uh, and that results in a much healthier Sugar Creek. Um, this summer, we will be removing the low head dam on Sugar Creek near the former power plant. Uh, that power plant has been shut down for many years uh, and the dam will be removed. Um, that will result in a, in a much safer uh, environment, but also improve the ecology of Sugar Creek itself. Um, and then we're also making some efforts to address high bank erosion in our community. Um, that is a very unique problem to Crawfordsville based on our geology with the creek flowing through and some of the high banks. Um, but it's a problem that has been uh, much, much worse in recent years due to the heavy rainfall events. So we're taking that very seriously and we'll be taking some steps, I hope, in the coming years to really mitigate that and address that issue in our community. When I talk about making long-term decisions or long-term uh, or making decisions based on the long-term impacts, um, I think it, it just really stands out that Crawfordsville leads the state of Indiana in municipal solar power. Uh, we are getting about 50% of our normal daily load, electrical load, from solar or renewable sources. Uh, that is absolutely a great step in the right direction, and we're not done there. We, we are working right now to bring more solar and renewable capacity uh, to our local grid, if you will. Uh, we're currently producing 28 megawatts. Our normal daily load is about 50 megawatts. Uh, we have five solar parks already completed, and as I said, we're already working on trying to bring some more to this community. Um, we've been working very aggressively to improve efficiency with our city operations. Uh, gradually changing out street lights and traffic signals. And if you can imagine your, you know, how much electricity you use in a home with lights, now multiply that with all the street lights in an entire city. Uh, it has a profound impact and we're working uh, pretty aggressively to, to really start making that change. Uh, it's happening block by block within the city. We also uh, are also working on mass transit in the state of Indiana. And I'm proud of the fact that Crawfordsville is one of the leaders in that discussion. Uh, passenger rail uh, is, you know, something that we've talked about for many years. And I can tell you right now, there is a lot happening behind the scenes to address passenger rail and mass transit in the state of Indiana. Uh, and you will see some announcements coming out in the next year or two uh, that will be very significant. And Crawfordsville will be really a key hub in that system. And we're very proud of that fact because we have to find ways to reduce uh, the number of vehicles on, on the roads and things like that. And uh, we are really stepping forward uh, behind the scenes right now to make sure that happens in the coming years. So uh, very proud of what's happening here. We have a long way to go, but I always say these things start locally. And if we can step up and, and at least get things started and lead by example, uh, I think you'll see other communities follow along. So thank you for joining this evening. I'm sure it will be a very good event. Uh, look forward to hearing what everyone has to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's fantastic news to hear. Um, next up, we have uh, Annabelle Prokopi from West Lafayette Climate Strikes and Confront the Climate Crisis. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Annabelle Prokopi, and as John said, I am a junior at West Lafayette High School, and I'm a member of West Lafayette Climate Strikes and the Confront the Climate Crisis campaign. So I don't have a slideshow. I'll just kind of talk about um, my experience with um, climate activism as a youth in Indiana and just about that. So yeah, just some backstory. Um, two years ago in 2019, I started West Lafayette Climate Strikes and it just kind of started with this vision of, you know, what I wanted the world to look like um, and just kind of seeing all of the youth climate strikes all around the world with Fridays for Future um, and that really inspired me to make a change in my own community. There was really nothing going on at the time. It was, um, you know, there was, I was trying to get involved in climate work and there really wasn't anything. So that's when I kind of um, decided, you know, if I want to see the change, I have to be the change. So 
as I said, I started by stopping at Climate Strikes. And um, from there, it really just took off. We decided we were going to have a climate strike in May of 2019, which was a pretty tight turnaround. We just decided to form it. And I just was talking to a lot of friends um, and we decided to plan this climate strike. And this was a really, really great experience. We had about, I think 150 people come out on a really tight um, notice. And it was really empowering and it really just made us want to do more which is what we did. And over that summer, we were meeting with legislators, um, really like building up our movement. And we had some really powerful climate strikes in late 2019 in September and one in November. And this was just very empowering to see the community coming together. We were able to pass a climate resolution here in West Lafayette, which binded us to a climate um, neutrality day, I think of 2038. So that was really exciting. And that was back in October, 2019. So then kind of from there, we wanted to keep um, organizing and keep growing our movement. And that's when COVID hit. So we unfortunately had quite a lot of plans for last spring. We were gonna do like a climate strike in April, all sorts of different things. But we had to make this quick kind of transition to an online format. And we made the decision early on that we wanted to keep organizing. We wanted to stay active. So we hosted um, climate strikes online all throughout last spring and summer, including one on April 24th last year. So that's that one year anniversary is kind of coming up, which is exciting. And those ended up being quite successful. We had a lot of people coming out to them. Um, and this just kind of gave us the opportunity to connect with people all across the state of Indiana, which was something we kind of wanted to do, but it had never really come to fruition before we came, became an, on an online format. It would have been a lot harder to talk to people. So this kind of brings us to the fall, last fall, when we'd been talking to people from around the state all spring and summer. And we were really um, inspired to come together on a statewide platform. And we realized there were climate action groups led by high schoolers all around Indiana, you know, very active ones here in West Lafayette, um, in Indianapolis, Carmel, um, many other places as well. So we decided as West Lafayette Climate Strikes to start the Confront the Climate Crisis campaign, which is a campaign of high schoolers from around Indiana who are demanding statewide climate action. And we weren't really sure how this was gonna go. You know, we never really done something like this, coming together with a lot of other people, but it has really taken off and it's been really, really exciting and really um, just really empowering for everyone to come together and to get to work with people all around the state. So I guess just about the Confront the Climate Crisis campaign, um, we have had virtual events. We had an event in March of, on March 19th, um, very recently at the State House. And that was a really exciting event where we brought a letter to Governor Holcomb's office. We're trying to meet with him by May 22nd. And we also declared a climate emergency as the students of Indiana down at the State House. And we're demanding that um, the governor also declares a climate emergency for Indiana. We've also um, achieved 10,000 signatures in our petition, um, all sorts of exciting things that we really think is gonna push Indiana to be that state that kind of takes, um, takes a role in climate action, takes their responsibility to make the change that they need to make. Even though Indiana might not be the most progressive state, um, it isn't the most progressive state, but I think we, with this pressure, we can see it kind of step up and take this responsibility. So this has been a very, very cool experience um, from West Lafayette climate strikes and confront the climate crisis. And yeah, I guess I can just talk a little bit about, you know, how being a youth climate activist has really made a difference in my life as well. Mm -hmm. um, it has made me definitely like view the world differently. Um, a lot of like critical thinking, but also just getting the chance to connect with people who are also very passionate about um, climate action and activism has been a really, really great experience. It's really like shaped who I am now over the past couple of years. Um, and yeah, it's just 
given me a lot of like connections as well with people who um, are willing to step up and make change. Yeah, thank you for putting that there. Um, so yeah, it's, as I said, it's been a really great experience. And I started a podcast last year as well. It's called On Strike with Insight. I can put that in the chat. And that's just kind of where, you know, I share my insights about activism. I'm having conversations with students um, all around the world, which is very um, exciting and interesting to hear from them and their perspectives on activism and how they're making changes in their communities as well. I think we can all learn a lot from each other. So yeah, that's a bit about me and about um, the impact that I'm hoping to make in Indiana with many other students. So I think I can pass on the mic now to whoever is next. Great, thank you for sharing. Um, we're gonna move on to Ian Rollins next, who is the student chair for the Environmental Concerns Committee at Wabash College. Yep, thank you, John. I appreciate that. Um, you know, firstly, I want to extend extend my gratitude for everyone that showed up today and also for John and the league for hosting this event. I think this will be a very productive discussion. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to how the rest of the event shapes up. Uh, I'm a sophomore at Wabash. I'm studying PPE, which is, you know, essentially a, a policymaking uh, type major where it incorporates philosophy, political science and economics. And I'm also minoring in business. And I am the current environmental concerns chairman for our student senate and for the college. Uh, I basically represent the student body in achieving various environmental objectives as a committee and as a campus. Uh, so I guess I'll, I'll, I'll talk about my background, I guess, and how I got to this position and then work my way into some of the initiatives that we've actually completed. Uh, so firstly, I started out as a member uh, of the committee. The committee was only in running for about a year. Uh, my freshman year. And so I served as a member just for my fraternity. And, you know, the chairman at the time had started the committee, but needed more active representation across campus. And so I figured, you know, might not be a bad idea to get involved and meet some people while I'm at it. And so uh, I served as a representative for that first semester of my freshman year. And then second semester, we were unfortunately sent home. And most of the progress that we had started to work on kind of halted. Uh, and then the position opened up because he was a senior at the time position position opened up to, you know, run for chairman of the committee. And I figured, um, I had a little bit of experience. I still had initiatives that I wanted to complete. So I went for it. I got the, got the chairman position. And, um, this has kind of been, I guess my first experience in implementing various initiatives. Uh, so I guess last semester, uh, Wabash itself was pretty limited with, um, I guess, in-person meetings, uh, events. So it was very difficult to combat that and rally the campus behind environmental objectives. Uh, so I started off with, with my committee, started off with some small things because, uh, as, as I'm sure you all know, every little action really does matter. You know, there's, there's no action that's too small. Um, so I started off. We, we made a weekly publication to put around campus um, with a lot of environmental tips and factoids, you know, that people probably had no clue about. Um, and, you know, being a college student, like there are a lot of things that you can be changing in your lifetime to become more environmentally conscious. So that was kind of our reasoning behind that. Uh, we, we felt that education for environmentalism is very important. And so spreading that to the campus was something that I felt was necessary. Uh, sorry, just trying to read the chat as I go here. Uh, okay. Yeah, no, I, I think so. I guess that that does make sense to me. I think the, uh, as far as I know, um, it was officially made a student Senate committee my freshman year. I believe that's where I was coming from, if that helps clarify uh, clarify things. So, yeah, so we started this weekly publication. Eventually, it made its way into our, our newspaper, The Bachelor. And, you know, it was it was a fun way to, I guess, suggest some lifestyle changes for students uh, and inform them of their daily impacts and, you know, some of the environmental impacts of their decisions. Uh, one of the other projects I worked on was ordering and making sure that each fraternity house had recycling bins, you know, as avid consumers of recyclables. To me, this was a no-brainer. 
Um, but as I found out during my first semester, recycling as a whole was pretty inconsistent. And so I wanted to make sure that at least we start here. I know it's a small action again, but wanted to make sure that this was something that was a necessity to all the houses, uh, in addition to some of the, the dining areas on campus. So we got that taken care of. Um, we also, this was towards the colder months. We, we started a tree planting initiative um, over by the Animal Welfare, uh, Welfare League building, if you're all familiar with that. Um, with the help of the committee, we basically uh, purchased like eight to 10 trees and we planted them as a campus. I had 35 to 40 Wabash students show up to that. So that was pretty, pretty surprising. I mean, given it was a really cold November morning, um, but it was good to see, you know, good to see that people, people cared, um, you know, and I thought it was a solid initiative. The feedback that we got from some of the, the county uh, citizens was, was very positive in that aspect. So it was, you know, it was a rewarding experience, even though we had to suffer the cold and brave the elements a little bit. Um, so I, that is something that I wanted to continue and probably will pass on to the, the next chairman, um, perhaps on a larger scale uh, within the community. And I also, so last semester, um, I thought it would be a good idea to uh, focus on utilities within living units. Uh, granted, we were getting into the colder months, uh, you know, when utilities are typically rising, like the gas bills and the heating bills and electricity bills. And so I thought it would be an interesting, um, an interesting contest type uh, if we, we encourage all these living units to decrease the amount of utilities and become more conscious of how much they're using, uh, you know, being more conscious of uh, leaving lights on for too long, you know, things like that, where it's a simple action, but it actually really does make a big difference. And I was pretty surprised to see that we had an overall decreasing trend um, from the first month that I collected the data and also the final month when I tallied up the results. Uh, the decreasing trend was pretty surprising, um, but, you know, it was really rewarding to see that most of the fraternity houses had significantly reduced their utilities. Uh, the independent halls were reducing. And so this, um, yeah, and the, the temperatures were also decreasing. So this was also surprising to me as you would think that maybe people would either A, not really care and continue to go on with their daily lives or just, you know, kind of forget about the contest and uh, disregard the contest and continue with their daily lives and increase their heat and whatnot because they're freezing. But this was actually not the case. And so I was very, very satisfied with with how that contest went. And uh, currently, and actually tonight, I've organized a, uh, a smaller fundraiser for uh, Friends of Sugar Creek. It's a, uh, it's a dodgeball type event. And what, what I've found most about Wabash students is that they're always willing to get out of their dorm rooms and, and come out and play some active action. You know, if there's something with, uh, with a sport involved, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to get people on board. So using that as an, uh, as an incentive for an environmental objective, I thought was a good way. Uh, so we're gonna raise some money for Friends of Sugar Creek, um, you know, with the environmental, uh, I guess, category in mind. And I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So I guess just overall, um, in my time, what I've realized as chairman and also as a member of that committee, um, it's difficult definitely to get a lot of people on board with your message. Um, it's difficult as and I'm, I'm sure most of you are, either in this same situation, um, dealing with, I guess, people uh, on an environmental topic, but it's difficult to get people to see where you're coming from as someone that's trying to make strides in environmentalism. Uh, but I think the biggest thing is incentivizing it a little bit. Uh, that definitely helps, at least helps me with events. Um, and so, you know, if you're planning things, it definitely helps to incentivize it. It's, a sec it's essentially a collective action problem um, and, you, and there's only really a couple ways that you can combat that issue. Uh, so finding out what those incentives is definitely a long and, you know, relatively difficult process, but it definitely makes for a very rewarding experience when progress in, um, our environmental impact as a campus and also as a county, uh, is decreased as a whole, you know, that's, that's the, that's the end goal is to essentially decrease, um, the human impact on the environment and so, you know, I've been trying to do my best as a as a chairman, um, trying to get everyone on this campus onto the same page, 
uh, to, you know, contribute towards that goal. And I think that we've done a solid job this semester. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that about wraps it up. I, I again, appreciate everyone who's showing up today and look forward to hearing the rest of you guys talk. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ian. That's a great list of initiatives. Um, we're going to hand it off next to Iris O'Donnell Belisario, who is a resilience coordinator with Earth Charter Indiana, amongst a number of other things. Thanks. Um, I'm really happy to be here. So just like a little background about me. Um, as John mentioned, I am a resiliency coordinator for Earth Charter Indiana, uh, specifically for the greater Lafayette community. Um, I also as of this month, I am a go on the Go Greener Commission as a commissioner um, for the city of West Lafayette. Um, I started out in climate activism, um, really when I was born is how I kind of phrase it. So I grew up in a home that emphasized people's roles in being stewards for nature and the environment. Uh, my family members were uh, vegan, we bought local produce, and we actively discussed ways to minimize our carbon footprint. Um, for me, this was just like normal. I thought everyone did it. Um, and then when I was in high school, Jim Poyser from Earth Charter Indiana brought his traveling game show, the Aim Too Late Late Show to school, which um, if you're not familiar, basically it's an environmental based game show in a way to uh, bring kind of make environmental education more entertaining. Um, so we did this for a couple of years and I volunteered um, to participate in it. Um, with one of my closest friends and the questions he was asking to me, I was like, Oh, I know the answer. I know the answer. Everything just seemed, I was like, Oh, this is easy. This is what I talked about at dinner with my parents. Um, and I realized going through that show, my classmates and my friends struggled really to understand these concepts. And then it really hit me. Uh, my family wasn't normal. Um, the way that I thought about the world wasn't normal. And a lot of our population in the world didn't weren't conscious of the human impact that we were having on the planet. Um, and I was really scared. I realized, you know, this is something that could be disastrous. Um, uh, my, I really realized that there's this huge knowledge gap in our society and that our leaders also didn't necessarily have the background information about the science. And they were making uneducated decisions about my future, not necessarily their future. They probably won't be here to experience those harsh impacts, um, but I'll be here. Future generations will. If I ever want to have kids, those kids are going to, you know, experience the brunt force of it. And so this realization evolved into me becoming an activist um, and not necessarily just for my future, but for the world around me, for all the living creatures that are going to be left on the planet after I leave the world. Um, it's, it was really a harsh awakening, um, realizing, you know, how do I, as a 15 year old girl at the time, um, change the world. Um, and so I started, um, small scale. I started with earth charter Indiana's climate camps as a camp counselor. Um, and what the climate camps, you know, were focused on is educating children on climate issues and guiding them towards solutions. Um, so I led different activities and one of my favorite ones was where we asked every, every attendee to put together or like they stood on it in a video and they shared what they wanted the world to look like when they grew up. And we wanted to use this as a way to talk to our, you know, politicians and our decision makers to say, hey, this is what we'd like our future to look like. What can you do to help us make sure that happens? Um, so after I was a part of those climate camps, I attended the climate reality training in Iowa, um, which if you're not familiar with climate reality, it's led by Al Gore. And that's when I started to really understand the science of it and what climate change really was. I understood humans were making an impact, but not necessarily, this is what climate change is. These are what, this is what you can do about it. And this is how you're being impacted. Um, so when I came back from that, I was really sad but also really empowered because I realized there were a lot of amazing solutions out there that we weren't using already, which meant I had an action to take. Um, so when I moved from Indianapolis to West Lafayette, I held my own climate camps uh, in West Lafayette because I wanted to find that group of kids that I had in Indianapolis. Um, and that didn't quite work out the way it did, 
But what it did do is get me in to the West Lafayette mayor's office. And so when I was around 17 years old, maybe it was 18, I started meeting with the mayor of West Lafayette. And it took me, I think, three to four years to really get anywhere with him. Um, but I was pretty persistently meeting with Mayor Dennis and meeting with the mayor of Lafayette, Mayor Rosorski. Um, and I think it was the summer of 2019 when Annabelle started the West Lafayette Climate Strike Group. And so I teamed up with them and we were able to pass the uh, West Lafayette first climate or climate resolution. And what that resolution did was establish that the city agreed climate change was a threat. Um, they were going to hold a resiliency clinic, which um, was basically a, a facilitated discussion between all the city leaders and key stakeholders in our community to evaluate what we wanted to see our climate action look like. Um, and from there, after that resiliency clinic, the city of West Lafayette performed a greenhouse gas inventory. So we were really able to see what is the impact that the city actually is having. Um, and as an activist, that allowed me to realize what do I want them to do next? Um, now that I know where they're not necessarily succeeding in, I could target those different areas. Um, and as a result of that, we amended that original resolution in fall of 2020. Um, to define a carbon neutrality date. And so that I believe is 2038. Um, and when I had one really neat thing is when I had first pitched the idea of a, a climate resolution, the mayor, I had said, let's try to achieve carbon neutrality by the year 2050. And he was like, that's not possible. Um, and so over a couple of years working with him, getting a lot of really passionate high schoolers involved in the process um, and a lot of community members engaged, we were able to take the 2050 isn't possible and bring that down by 12 years. I think I did the math right, yeah. Uh, <laughs> by 12 years, which was a huge difference, I think. Um, as an even like, I'd say almost miraculous uh, transition from the city of West Lafayette to doing that, they've now partnered with the county, so Tippecanoe County and the city of Lafayette are working on developing a regional climate action plan. And as far as we know, there isn't any other um, municipality that's doing the same kind of partnership. Um, so it's been really neat to be a part of that. This model that West Lafayette is like slightly developing, I guess, is also being used in Northwest Indiana um, with by one of my uh, like coworkers, Kathy. Um, so she is leading an initiative with 16 different municipalities in Northwest Indiana that are trying to mimic that same process of, of developing a regional climate action plan altogether. Um, is there, have there been any questions in the chat that I've missed? Oh, yeah. I think so. The question about the county council, I'm not on the county or city council. It's the like environmental commission or city has. So I'm a commissioner on that. Um, and it's a, just like a volunteer one. Um, you're not elected for that. Um, so a couple other things that I've been involved in more recently as COVID's kind of developed, um, we've moved to trying to figure out how we can actually bridge this big education gap in the community. And I've been working with um, some a really passionate high schooler, Ethan, on the little, we're calling the Little Free Resilient Library. So we built eight small libraries that we're going to be installing across the community um, that will only have like climate change education center content. And so we have books that are um, meant for elementary through seniors, basically all stages of life. The goal is that we'll have something that can teach you something or if you already know all of it, bring something that you think can teach others. Um, and just, I think, trying to leave off on like a really, really strong positive note is I know the past year and a half has probably been really difficult for a lot of people. Um, COVID has been an absolutely kind of horrible, horrible event. Um, but it's also done 
a really amazing thing in my eyes. It's brought our world leaders together in a way that I didn't believe was possible. It's helped prove that our world leaders can work together to fight a crisis. They can work together to set goals to minimize the impacts of a crisis. And most importantly, they can fight the climate crisis. They've proven they have the skills to put that together. Um, and so I would say I am more hopeful um, than I've ever been about solving the climate crisis. And I'll leave it at that. Great, thank you, Iris. That's a, an, an impressive body of activist work um, from all of our speakers. And now we're gonna open it up to questions from everybody. So go ahead and unmute yourself if you've got a question, uh, or you can feel free to put it in the chat if you'd rather not unmute yourself, and I can uh, read it out. And if no one asks a question, I'm going to have to come up with some. So. I think I saw one from Cheryl. Yeah. Um, about the regional plan. So that right now, my understanding is the goal is that that's countywide. So looking at all the municipalities in the in Tippecanoe County, um, they are contracting with a consultant. So I don't know if it's too far along to extend to be like a multi-county um, project, but I know that in Northwest Indiana, they are doing a multi-county regional plan. Um, so there is like a precedence for doing that now. All right, there's a question for Annabelle. Uh, what data benchmarks does your group monitor in Indiana? For example, are you watching for decreases or changes in non-attainment areas, et cetera? Uh, yeah, so are you just kind of asking like if we've noticed like more people getting involved who weren't previously involved in climate action? This is Cheryl. What I what I meant was, since you're obviously involved in a statewide effort, mm -hmm. uh, and congratulations to to all of you young people. I mean, you're the you're the next generation, right? Um, but you know how how are you monitoring to see if Indiana is working to decrease their carbon footprint in all areas? And you know, for for instance non-attainment versus attainment areas. Um, a, a, as you know, or if you don't know, non-attainment areas are those uh, designated by the federal government uh, of very highly, uh, what I wanna say, particles in, in the air. So dirtier air for, for lack of better terminology. And so the goal has always been for communities and, and states to work to reduce those footprints so that there are less non-attainment areas in Indiana. And that plays uh, a critical role in, in my work as, as economic development and trying to attract business opportunities to uh, Crawfordsville and Montgomery County. So I was just curious from a statewide effort with your group, are you monitoring certain indicators that would tell us if Indiana really is um, putting their, their money where their, where their mouth is, so to speak. Yeah, so we haven't um, really taken on like initiatives like that, like kind of tracking, but something that we are trying to do, and that would be really interesting to do um, in the future. But yeah, something we are trying to do is pass climate emergencies in cities around Indiana. Um, so hopefully like, through this initiative, we will be able to see like more cities passing like resolutions and then decreasing um, their carbon emissions in like tangible and see and like visible ways. Um, and we're also working with like the Sierra Club trying to get the Duke super polluters down in Southern Indiana to um, close um, or at least to partially close since those are definitely very big um, polluters in Indiana. Um, yeah, and unfortunately, I don't know if we'll be able to see um, tangible changes um, in the very near future in terms of like carbon levels, um, just since we have just started, but hopefully that's something we can start to um, like measure and take into account in the next couple of years. Okay. 
Great. Um, so we have another question. Um, what keeps you motivated when you hit roadblocks? I think this is a good question for all three of you. And it kind of goes along with what Jamie Margolin wrote in her book, Youth to Power. Um, something that helps activists get through things uh, is, is what is their why? So, so, you know, why do you do what you do and, and what keeps you motivated to keep going? I guess I can go. Um, for me, something that definitely keeps me going is just being able to work with a lot of other people who um, care about the same things. Um, it's been really great to be able to meet a lot of people through this and a lot of like lifelong friends. So that definitely keeps me motivated. And then I think my why um, for activism is just like making a change. Um, I'm passionate about what I do because it's I'm seeing a tangible like change in um, Indiana. So I think those two things combined keep me very motivated. All right, Ian. Yeah, going off of what Annabelle just talked about, I think seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, you know, seeing the, the perspective progress that you can make with all of these initiatives and projects and events and, you know, strikes, seeing all the progress. Um, you might have to visualize it at the time when things get tough, but if you have enough support around you, um, and you know, if, if, if you actually believe in the message that you're trying to get across, it's fairly easy to at least picture that in your head and keep on going. Uh, you know, it's, it's all about staying motivated and staying true to the mission that you're trying to implement, um, in, in wider circles and just your nearby circles, if that makes sense. Like, um, you know, the more people that you can connect with, the more people that you can uh, put your mission um, and kind of not, I wouldn't say force your mission on them because, you know, that doesn't seem exactly like the right way of phrasing it. But the more people that you can connect with and share your message, I think that that can only stand to benefit you and your mission. Um, so, yeah, I guess just focusing on the, the idea of making progress is something that keeps me going. All right, Iris. Um I would say probably the biggest thing that keeps me motivated right now is like youth like Ian and Annabelle. Um, I get to work with a lot of the West Lafayette climate strike and the confront the climate crisis youth. And they give me so much hope because they are the future leaders. And it is so inspiring to see their passion and um, just all of their energy, I guess. They never really burn out. And I don't know how they do it. Um, but, you know, knowing that they are going to be the future leaders um, of our world is really inspiring for me. Um, the other thing is, you know, a lot of the youth that I started out working with when I was 15 have burnt out. And so I take um, one of the things that's helped me stay motivated this long, which it's been, I think, I don't know how long. Uh, it's been a while, um, but has been taking like little breaks to just disconnect um, and kind of find why, what that why is. And for me, it's really nature and wildlife and I mean, the beautiful world that we live in. And so taking time to reconnect with that um, and with kind of my roots of why I started in this has been really helpful. Great. Um, so the next question was, are there any specific climate change organizations in Crawfordsville that young people can join? I gave uh, a list of five links there and, and six, if you count 350.org at the bottom. Um, I believe I covered um, the organizations that, that you are affiliated with, and I had a link to Friends of Sugar Creek higher up, which Ian mentioned. But if uh, any of you want to give a plug to, to any local organizations or, or national ones that you could... Uh, uh, join in. Um, feel free to do so now. All right. I guess I've got them covered. Um, so, Brock, you had a question? Go ahead. First of all, I do want to say to all three of you, thanks for being here. It's awesome seeing you guys. And uh, Annabelle, I've been seeing you in action for quite a while we uh me uh, one of my kids and one of her friends we joined one of your strikes in 2019 and that was just absolutely awesome up there in west lafayette and uh i 
I'm sorry about COVID because obviously it did put a damper on things. Um, but there were positives to that too, I know. Um, so congratulations for what you're doing. So my question is, uh, how are kids today learning the basics about climate change? And is it sufficient? And I mean, in general, uh, not kids that just are internally motivated, but are, are, we, are we reaching out enough to kids, do you think? Uh, are you seeing enough education in schools? And what, are the, what opportunities are we missing on climate change education? That's for all three of you, by the way. Why don't we start out with uh, uh, Iris, if that's okay, just to start from the older generation and move on down. Um, I would say the biggest thing is I never heard about climate change in school. Um, and I went to 12 different schools in the state of Indiana. Not a single one talked about it. Um, and so that is the biggest thing is that it's not in our curriculum and it should be a state mandated um, thing that's taught to students. Um, even when I went to university, I had professors who'd start out a sustainability course by saying, I don't want to hear it. Climate change isn't real. Don't bring it up. Um, and so I think the biggest issue with reaching youth is that the people teaching uh, environmental science or even just basic science don't have the necessary education. Um, in terms of resources to reach those kids outside of school, um, I think Earth Charter Indiana does a really good job of that with work, finding um, teachers who are passionate and want to bring that into their classroom. Um, so Jim, in pre-COVID days, would travel all across the state, going into schools, doing different presentations, and working with the students. And he'd go time and time again. And I mean, that's you know how I got looped into it. Um, I think there we did a series of like online webinars that we interacted um, students virtually last spring, I think. Um, and I think that was also a successful way. There is now a, a series of online resources. I'm going to blank on where this is, um, but it was developed by Earth Charter Indiana, the Purdue Climate Change Research Center, and a third entity. Um, and it is lesson plans developed for all grades um, with prepared material for teachers so they can bring climate change into their room that's backed by science and they don't have to actually, you know, write all their own activities. So that is a new resource that just came here. Um, and I think that will hopefully be a game changer in bringing that into the classroom. And then I guess I'll pass that to Ian. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess echoing along similar lines there. Um, I would say that um, Wabash has actually been fortunate enough to include a lot of climate change uh, topics and subjects into the curriculum. You know, even if you're not someone that's studying science, um, you know, it's, you're still able to learn more about the subject, which I think is really important. Um, you know, obviously, I'm not really a, uh, a science major type guy. I'm more in the poli sci area looking to go to law school. but um, I had the opportunity to take just a, a really basic intro level biology class last semester um, and was pretty, uh, you know, relieved that we included a substantial portion uh, dealing with evidence of climate change, you know, and this kind of addresses one of the questions in the chat, but um, I think this was hinted at earlier. Um, you know, all of the scientists and experts about, I think about 90%, if not more, they all agree that this is a real thing. Um, all of the experts are saying the same exact thing. Um, so it kind of comes down to the point where uh, you either agree with science and the experts that are that are preaching these points and preaching that, you know, there are real uh, crises that are developing in the environment, or, you know, you, you can ignore the science and the, the facts that are, in my opinion, pretty blatant. Um, I mean, we, we covered how the global temperatures on average are rising. Um, I think that that goes without saying um, just oceans that are warming. It's like something like 0.13 degrees uh, per decade, which might not sound like a whole lot, but long term, I mean, that's that's a substantial amount. And that's obviously going to have massive repercussions, um, like obviously ice melting, things like that. There's all this science that backs up um, 
the idea that climate change actually does exist. And so I, I think to answer the question in the chat, um, it's simply a matter of educating people uh, to make sure that they are informed of the actual data behind these claims. They're not just made out of thin air. These claims are actually backed up by science. Um, and so I guess, yeah, to, to wrap it up, and I'm not going to try and steal Annabelle's spotlight here, but I think that um, the most important thing is to just, I guess, promote some type of env environmental education on a massive, uh, massive scale. Um, I, we're all fortunate at Wabash to have a relative, uh, relatively, I'd say beneficial curriculum that includes things like this, but I know that that's not, that's definitely not the case for high schools. I went to a public high school in the sub suburbs of Chicago. That was definitely not the case for us. Um, and it seems like Iris had a relatively similar experience with all of the Indiana high schools. So I think that's something that we can go to on maybe a state level or federal level where you do incorporate that into a curriculum so that you do start at a younger age, you start getting, um, you know, you start putting climate change into the next generation of youth leaders that are behind us. Um, so yeah, I think that's what I'll stick with. Um, yeah, just kind of like going off of that, of like the importance of education. Um, after our September 2019 strike, we were actually able to convince our school to implement an AP environmental science course. So that's happening now. Um, and it talks about climate change a bit more this semester than last semester. But I think that's helpful and just at least like getting the word out so people can at least get educated if they don't have other resources to get educated about climate change. Um, but as for like our like team, a lot of us knew about climate change, but we really just took it on ourselves to educate ourselves um, through like reading things and watching things and just like talking to people. So that was really helpful for us. And yeah, just what Iris was talking about as well with just the importance of like, you know, gym coming into schools and just spreading it that way in like fun ways and just trying to implement more classes. I know not very many high schools have the climate change courses. So that's a very important thing I think to implement in more schools and hopefully in like younger grades too in elementary school. All right, thank you. Um, we're nearing the end of our time. I'm gonna stick around as long as anybody else wants to to keep the meeting open, but uh, our speakers um, have dedicated a lot of time to us. I thank them very much for being here. I know Ian has a prior commitment and I can't take up all of Annabelle and Iris's time either, but we are going to announce the book giveaway. Uh, Brock, uh, I believe randomly selected a couple people to, to give away Youth to Power books. Yeah, uh, thank you everybody for coming. This has been a really wonderful event. Thank you to our guests, our speakers. Uh, I loved it, I really did. And uh, again, we're recording this, so uh, I hope to really reach out to more people than, than uh, we're able to come tonight. Um, so the winners of our book, or of the book are, uh, forgive me if I for, uh, mispronounce names here, Raul Dury. Uh, Regan Cox and Jordan Young. So Raul, Regan, and Jordan, congratulations. You can pick up your book at uh, the Crawfordsville Public Library. Uh, you can pick it up anytime after tomorrow at noon. And also, I want to, uh, we want to give out a special uh, thank you gift to uh, Mr. Andrew Showers, a science teacher at uh, North Montgomery High School, and Mr. Tony Gonzaro, a science teacher at South Montgomery High, South Mount High School. Uh, we really, really uh, are thrilled that you joined us and participated tonight. Um, you, you, you reach out to a lot of kids and the work that you do, and we just also want to thank you for all the work that you are already doing. So thank you very much, and congratulations, congratulations to our winners. All right, and uh, we'd like to thank the paper of Montgomery County, the Crawfordsville General Review, uh, local school principals throughout the county, local businesses who posted our flyer to help promote the event, uh, the 106.3 radio station that hosted me for an interview yesterday, and of course the whole climate team that helped put this together, Brock Irvin, Helen Hudson, Mark Hudson, Don Bonebreak, and me. 
And of course, our speakers and Mayor Barton for being here tonight and sharing some of their time. I know that Earth Day is an especially busy day for this community, and you probably had a number of events to choose from. Ian uh, is already off to his next one, helping out with Friends of Sugar Creek for other conservation efforts. So absolutely great of you all to be here. Uh, again, I will stick around till everyone else filters out. So if there's anything else people want to talk about climate, um, feel free to, to ask. Um, but if you got to go, that's the session. Thanks for being here.